Good evening. My name is Larry Gross. I'm the director of the School of Communication, and I'd like to welcome you all to a, an event in the Vision and, Vision and Voices series here at the Annenberg School. And very appropriately for the Annenberg School and for Visions, and even Voices, uh, we'll be looking tonight and speaking about visual images and social change, a topic that is of great interest. Oh, I thought this was all miked. Um, can you hear me now? Uh, I'm, I'm miked here and here. I would, uh, as I was saying, uh, <clears throat> visual communication and social change is a topic that is of great interest to many of us in the School of Communication and, and in the School of Journalism. Uh, I don't need to tell you that we live in a world that is saturated with visual images. If you started trying to count the number of pictures and images that you see in any given day, uh, I think you would quickly give up and simply agree that we constantly are encountering visual images. Many of them, probably too many of them, are trying to sell us something. Uh, and many of them are telling us things about the world filtered through institutions that may have a somewhat narrower view of what we need to know, should know, deserve to know. But tonight we are going to be meeting two visual creators, artists, photographers, video makers, who work outside of that often too narrow stream, and people who take on the challenge and the responsibility often of showing us the images that we don't often see, the images that are not surrounding you all the time, the ones that you won't see often on television, you won't see in the pages of People magazine. But for that reason, really, and I think particularly in a university, it is important and it is really part of our responsibility as a university to see and think about and talk about these images and what they tell us about our society. It is really one of the functions of a university is to broaden the horizons and widen the scope of what it is that we are told about the world that we all live in. So we have two, as I'm sure you know, two photographers, visual artists with us today. They will each show us some of their work and then we will have a discussion uh, with all of us and with them. First will be Nina Berman, who will show photographs from her acclaimed series on wounded veterans from the Iraq war, accompanied by work from her Homeland book, which documents the militarization of American life and the fantasies we construct in pursuit of empire and security. Nina Berman is a documentary photographer with a primary interest in the American political and social landscape. Her work has been extensively published, exhibited, and collected, receiving awards in art and journalism from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the World Press Photo Foundation, the Open Society Institute, and Hasselblad, among others. She's the author of two books, Homeland and Purple Hearts, Back from Iraq, and I believe we will have a book signing afterwards so you can <clears throat> get up close and personal with the books. Take them home. Her photographs of wounded veterans from the Iraq War have been exhibited at galleries and museums worldwide including the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. It's a great pleasure to introduce Nina Berman. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, shortly after the Iraq War began, I wanted to find a way to cover it. I was, um, felt alienated from the coverage on television and felt that I wasn't um, intimately connected with what was happening there. And I also felt a little bit lied to by the coverage on television. Um, I wasn't seeing any images of wounded people, Iraqis or Americans. And so I went about to try and find uh, 
U.S. soldiers who had come back from the war seriously wounded. <clears throat> I made a couple of aesthetic decisions when I took the pictures. Um, I imagined them as not as um, people surrounded by a community of others, but I pictured them alone. Um, I sought them out in their hometown, so you have a domestic setting as opposed to a battlefield setting. Um, and I found them at a very particularly vulnerable moment in their lives when they have just begun this transition from able-bodied warrior, um, confident, physically fit, to um, disabled veteran with no um, clear future path. And so um, this was a self-assigned project, and um, I interviewed them before I photographed them. I didn't imagine at first that I would use the audio. I just interviewed them um, thinking I would write text, which I did. But then as I transcribed it, the audio was so compelling for me, and, and I felt made the pictures come alive in a different way. Um, so I fashioned a movie that today in 2010 looks a bit crude, but um, considering all the advances and just equipments and everything. But I wanted to show you that tonight, and it's about nine minutes long, and then I'll show you some other work. I was always considered a pretty boy when I was in, you know, high school, and you know, I always relied on my physical appearance. That's what I always went off of. That's why sometimes I, I look at it and I say, I'm glad this happened to me, because it opened my eyes and then we realized that I do have something where I can reach out and touch people with just my words. I want to stay in because the Army's, you know, I just, I got addicted to, and I, and I like it. So I'm this great Army soldier. I'm this great picture of the Army. I've been dealing with the military since I was like a sophomore in high school. They came to the school like six times a year. All military branches, they had a recruiting station like a block from our high school. You know, it was like right there in your face. I had a friend when I was six years old. His name was Charles and he got killed. I think he was shot in the head. My older sister was killed last year. My father was killed when I was seven. He was being robbed. So, I mean, death has just always been around. So I was prepared. I mean, it's actually kind of funny. Like, you know, my situation with me losing both my legs, it's like, I prepared myself for it. Things like that, you know, I've always had on my mind. I thought about going to war and uh, it just kind of, you know, scared me in a way. Because, you know, I didn't really think about it before I signed up. And when I did go to war, I was scared. <laughs> I heard two booms, and I looked to my left, and I heard an AK going off down below the building. I didn't know whether to run or what to do. I thought it was gonna blow up, so I just closed my eyes. The hit from it just split it open, like if you were to take a hammer to a melon and just smash it open. It's kind of what the effect it had on my legs. Throughout um, all the hospitals I've been to, I've had seven blood transfusions. And I've been in the operating room 15 times. I feel bad sometimes. I feel like I'm not doing my part. I wish I could point the finger at one person and just take them out, but all the pain and suffering I've been through, there ain't much I can do. I was angry at the people over in Iraq. I don't trust them, I don't like them. We'd have to get information. You know, stack on the house and just go in, do whatever we needed to do. Yeah, they were scared, you know. You have like nine Americans busting into your house, just screaming, pointing weapons. Yeah, they were scared. The excitement, the adrenaline, never knowing what's gonna happen. I'm an adrenaline junkie and I like that. I got respect. I get respect from other people. Don't even know me. Come up and shake my hand. I want to thank you. My uncles. I got a lot of respect from them. I did something with my life. Instead, you know, sitting around doing nothing. I went and made something of myself. And you just watch, you know, the news or you watch the war movies on TV. We'd sit there and watch them. Watch a lot of John Wayne movies, too. It's all, you know, cowboy and Indians and then the war movies. 
President Bush took over the National Guard. I told my wife that now I can be called at any time, and I was called. It was scary, but I know how to do it. So I went and I did it. And it was, how can I say, my destiny. And I felt inside me empty because my wife wasn't there. My last memory is being in charge of the platoon. Now I like being with the kids and my wife. I take them with me to Veterans Hospital. They needed some young guys, so I volunteered to do it to help them out. He has a four year old son, Brody. Family, which she she's no longer. He's talking about his wife. She's left him now. Yeah, I don't, I don't. But you're all right, though, aren't you? You're tough. You you made it through this. Yeah. You can handle anything now. I just don't have nothing in the more. Or... Yes, you do. There's somebody out there that's gonna love you. Yeah, it's what I'm hoping for. I don't know. For the shit, the shippy. I don't know. It's kind of hard. It's hard for me to explain. Nobody really knows, I mean, what these soldiers are going through, what's happening to them. Like, they see on TV, oh, yeah, you know, two soldiers got wounded today, and they think, oh, yeah, he'll be all right, you know. But that soldier's scarred for life, like, physically and mentally. And, like, you know, it's like they don't understand. Like, they don't, they just see, oh, yeah, one soldier wounded, and they'll forget about it, like, as soon as they change the channel. <laughs> It looks cool on TV, but, you know, once you go and, like, you know, you see people getting hurt and, you know, you see, like, the people that you're supposed to hate, like the enemy or whatever, you see them hurt, you know, it's just, like, it's confusing. It's really confusing. Like, all the reasons that we went to war, it just seems like they're not legit enough, you know, like, for people to lose their lives for and for me to lose my hand and like my buddies to lose their limbs. And it's just, we wanna know. Well, I know I wanna know. He wants to know why we went, the real reason. I mean, I feel like I, I deserve to know. The concentration camp over there, the prison. And that's why I did most of my time over there. That's why I got hurt at over there. It was crazy. They wake up about five o'clock in the morning, all of them, not just one, all of them. And they walking like zombies. Like Walking Dead. Well, most of my dad friends, I, they was, my soldier, they was losing it out there. And I would go and tell them, hey, man, look, he don't have long here. I have one of my guys uh, tell me, man, my wife just had my son. I can't wait to get home and see him. You know, he died out there. He sure did. And I have to think about that every day because I promised him that he was going to get home to see his newborn child. Strap metal down the back. Strap my arm, it came in and hit my head. I broke both of my arms. His shoulder is messed up. That strap metal came in and punched my lungs. The blast sign did something to my kidneys. Yeah, I lost the kidney. It pretty much took my life. Pretty much. I got a bonus in the National Guards for re um, joining the Army. Okay. Now that I switched over to a uh, regular Army, I got to pay a bonus back. But he was told that he wouldn't have to pay the bonus back. That's right. Back. The reason he couldn't stay now for the certain length of time is because he got injured. So they're making him pay that yeah, money back. back. Yeah, that's right. Can't get nothing. And I'm burning. I'm burning on that side. They let him down. All of my high school buddies are dead in jail or just cracked up. Two of them just got thumped in a ditch around there, dead. And the rest of them in jail, cracked up, for real. 
That's why I'm gone. I, when I got out of high school, I left. I was gone because I know where my life was headed. Join the Army. Yeah, I am. Back here. Different, but back here. <laughs> I would love to go away. I would love to go away. Because I'm doing nothing. I don't know what it's going to end up. So um, when I did this work, I was always asked if I was pro-war or anti-war, if the pictures were pro-war or anti-war pictures. And um, I never would say, because I felt like when you do imagery of veterans in particular, people I feel like, and, and media, mass media in general, I think these days, try and simplify the stories put you in, a, in some sort of um, category, some sort of corner. And for me, doing this work, I learned a lot. And um, it may have started as just sort of documentary evidence shot in a portrait style of the human cost of war. But I learned a lot about why people join, the gratification or satisfaction that they get or don't get from it, sense of betrayal maybe that comes with um, dealing with the veterans' bureaucracy, and then the sense of isolation when they come home. And so I, um, I've resisted continuously to um, put myself in any particular category. I operate in the editorial world, and I had a lot of difficulty getting this work published in the United States, but then um, the kind of opinions seemed to change. And in 2006, I was asked to do an assignment by probably the ultimate mass market magazine, People magazine. And um, they gave me an assignment. Hold on one second. To photograph this couple, it was supposed to be a, a kind of um, fairy tale ending, right? Like severely wounded Marine marries high school sweetheart. And the pictures that they ran was this picture. And this was their main picture. And then pictures that other magazines around the world ran of the story was either this picture or this picture. The picture that I choose, and that's my interpretation of what I saw and felt, is this picture and then a whole other series. And so, um, I wanted to show you what um, magazines publish and then my point of view because um, who's to say what's the true story but um, this is my vision and um, clearly another photographer may have shot it a completely different way but this is what I saw as I visited this couple. So this is Sergeant Ty Ziegel, he was a Marine Reservist, he was wounded on his second tour in Iraq. This is Renee Klein, his high school, school sweetheart, and I followed them on three trips in 2006 in Texas and in Illinois where they live. So this was them at their wedding portrait studio the morning of their wedding. And then these are a series of pictures that I did as I was with them. So mag magazines, um, their narrative was, um, you know, love conquers all, even and more. And what I felt was uh, an intense loneliness and disconnection. The couple separated three months after they um, were married. Um, and then I, I went back in 2008 for a few days just to um, visit Ty and see how he was doing. So the pictures are kind of these um, quiet moments. I see them as almost like anti-typical photojournalism because nothing's really happening in the pictures. They're just kind of sitting there. For me, what I was struck by was like the ordinary nature of these little activities, but then like the sort of um, evidence of something very seriously wrong. 
So these typical American scenes where something is, is terribly wrong. his mother. And then I asked him to take me out to this piece of land that he kept talking about. This is like out in the middle of nowhere. No one lives there. And he owns this piece of land and he had an envisioned building a house there for himself to live. Sorry for the sloppy transitions here. When I photographed him, I found this bumper sticker. This is his brother's truck. Um, his brother eventually did two tours, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. And it's kind of, you know, I guess it's supposed to be a joke, but it didn't feel like a joke, seeing that what happened to his brother, what happened to Ty. And so I, I never show this picture with the series, with the other pictures. I feel like it would, it's, it's too much of a statement to put in, but I did put it in a book I did called Homeland, where I took a look at um, the militarization of daily life. And so I'm just gonna show you a few pictures from that series. So this is New York City, um, right after the first bombing of Afghanistan. This was taken in Shanksville, where the uh, fourth plane went down. It was taken a year after 9-11 at a memorial. Um, often in my pictures, I remove um, information that will show you the context and so that the pictures become more symbolic as images, as opposed to simply um, informative. This was a White House communication team at that event. After 9-11, we became very um, preoccupied by making sure that first responders were, were um, up to speed in handling disasters. So you can see all across the country these like almost you know, multi-million dollar <coughs> extravagant exercises. In this particular case, it's um, terrorists have attacked Midway Airport in Chicago. As I would photograph these, I, I, I kept asking myself a question, you know, what was the what was the insistence on more and more training of first responders when 9-11 was not a failure of first responders? It was a, an intelligence failure, but the re first responders behaved um, as they should have. So I would, look, I would look for examples like daily manifestations of Homeland Security, and I found this um, Senior Citizens Volunteer patrol, patrol in Florida, and these patrols still exist all across the state. So they go around and they look for suspicious objects, bombs, packages, whatever they can find. This was um, potassium iodide pickup in North Carolina. Um, potassium iodide is a pill you're supposed to take in case of um, radiation leaks or nuclear weapon or nuclear war. And so they, they gave this out all across the country in 2002. I was struck by the, the, the community spirit at some of these events, that, and, I, and it occurred to me that, that we create community through these militarized experiences. This is a town outside of Chicago. There are three of these billboards in the town. Nuclear war in Indiana. For locals, it's, an, it's a form of job. Um, I mean, these are these people here, these extras, um, are paid twice the local wage, and so it can become a very good source of income. These are games that SWAT forces play in Florida. This is a, there's a couple of bases in the US where troops have to go through, have to rotate through to get cultural sensitivity training. So these are local civilians pretending they're Iraqis. To me, it looks like a, a passion play. <laughs> Just a street in New Jersey on July 4th. Fort Bragg, um, 
for what's called All-American Day, also at Fort Bragg. Some of these pictures are kind of funny, yet as I was taking them at the same time, taking all these pictures of very wounded soldiers, I would find myself less amused and more kind of mortified. This is in New York City. The Marines, uh, the US Marines set up this kind of um, something called Marine Day, and they, they um, would stage these activities in nine places around New York City, and they're basically recruiting events. And this is the stealth bomber over Atlantic City. And um, that's the last picture. Thank you. We'll now see and, and hear from John Lowenstein, who will share some of his award-winning work, Shadow Lives USA, which is a 10-year documentary journey through the world of undocumented Latino immigrants. His images present the daily reality of unauthorized existence, including deportations, border crossings, fragmented families, and strife, all in the context of increasing political concern over the integrity of America's borders. Lowenstein has been a professional photographer for more than 10 years, and he specializes in long-term, in-depth projects that confront the realms of power, poverty, and violence. John? All right. Just want to say great job Nina and um, thanks um, I always really inter learn something new whenever I see Nina talk uh, about her work and so it's really great and thanks also to USC Annenberg for having us to come and be a part of this and show our work because uh, one of the hardest things these days is finding um, ways to actually impact people and show the work that we spend a lot of our time doing and so it's always good to have active minds listening and watching and questioning, and that's what we do it for, to get it out and show what's going on. So I'm gonna start by showing some, some images from the project that started called Shadow Lives Yet. Hold on, sorry. Yep, uh, that started about uh, Ten years ago, when I was working on a project called uh, Chicago in, in the year 2000, and it was during this time <clears throat> when uh, we, we there was about eight photographers and 150 other part-time photographers, and our charge was to show what the city of Chicago was like during the year 2000, so that in a thousand years from there, we would be able to um, uh, offer a time capsule of life in the year 2000, and so I started to kind of look at what, are, what the city was made up and what's going on. So I started to photograph day laborers in the city and families. And this led me on this journey that kind of just went on over the years um, from the day labor corners to the border to uh, Guatemala City to photograph social violence back across the border and looking at really what is this uh, why do people come here from Central America and Mexico? Why, why do they leave their country? Why do they risk everything to, to uh, make a new life in a place that uh, offers this kind of idea of a dream and for some a much better life and for others not necessarily a better life? And so I just really set out to try to look at what this place is, what this space and who the people are who are who are living these lives. 
I, I was really felt it was important in each photograph to, to really give you the idea of what is what it's like to be on the ground. That's one of my most important roles as a photographer is like I'm there. And so if I can give you that feeling, a little bit of that feeling of what it's like to be on the ground while uh, you're witnessing these, these scenes um, and people's lives, then I think I've done what I can. And then to try to get that out to as many places and as clearly and uh, as possible so I can show the humanity of, of people. And so this was a situation in uh, Guatemala City in Zone 6. City's broken up into different zones, and this kid had been, uh, was lying on top of his brother who had been murdered in a retaliation for another murder. <clears throat> and, you know, there's a lot of reasons that people leave their home country uh, sometimes. You know, the meta narrative is that everybody leaves simply for jobs and for an economic opportunity. But I think there's a lot, of, I've found people leave for a variety of reasons, social violence being one of them. So that's why I spent so much time uh, photographing this and kind of exploring this issue in Guatemala. And when we see what's going on also in Mexico now, with the drug war, it's also a, becomes a reason for people to migrate. So um, I think like Nina, and uh, we, I really try to show some of the complexity of what's going on in the, in the issue and in the story. I really try to give an idea of um, how is it gonna, I guess the, just the, the complexity through the different experiences. And this is like the, one of the largest transnational migrations in world history, the, the amount of people, the millions of people who have come to the United States and uh, live here now, it um, makes up a very important and uh, part of our country. So I'm going to show a couple pictures. This is in Guatemala City. These are migrants from other countries in Latin America. This is in Reynosa on the border. Guatemalan migrants in southern Mexico. These guys ended up making it to the U.S. And again, you know, why, this kind of powers that uh, go on. And I, I don't generally uh, edit my pictures in a completely, you know, okay, it starts here, you know, the people start here, and then they go there and, and cross all the way. I think that for many people who come to the U.S., it's, there's this reality of what they do physically, what you have to do, and then there's the, the dream of going home, and so, and the dream of return, and that someday there'll be some way to go home. And so a lot of people do go home of their own will and some people end up staying. So it's kind of like, I try to edit it in this fashion that has a back and forth of that psychological space. And these are people, these are Guatemalan and Central American migrants leaving in a town called Naranjo on the border between Mexico and Guatemala. So this is on the Guatemalan side and almost everybody here is still legal at this point. And as they board these trucks, they're, they know they're going on to a, a, a place. Um, they're starting this incredibly long, arduous journey into very dangerous. And it's become increasingly dangerous as our border policies have closed the border, both on the northern border and the U.S.-Mexico border. We've put up a lot of different fences and militarized the border in a lot of different ways. And we've also put pressure on the Mexican government to close down their borders even further south, what's called the gilded border, the southern border, the silver border. And so we, this is kind of like why I followed that. And just recently there were 72 migrants massacred in uh, Tamaulipas in um, northern Mexico. And so these are the same people who could like, would go on this kind of journey. And so I think we're seeing this intersection between the cartels controlling the smuggling and the drug war. So there's really an intersection of the, these two areas. And then it impacts people's lives, and that's what I've been trying to show. I'll let them run some more. That's going through the jungles on the back of the, the trucks. They stop at these little places and eat deer. You can hear the monkeys in the... And this is once you get to the northern border. 
crossing the Rio Grande in the water. And then some of the old fences they built. These are the old fences they built in 1994. Uh, for you know journalism students, I think it's interesting for you guys to know how you get access. I mean, Nina is a master at access, and we, you know, in terms of getting access, you you have to find a lot of different ways. So this was a story. I knew that people were being that migrants were being buried who were unidentified in paupers' graves in Arizona at the time. So yeah, sometimes you, you, you just start digging around trying to find who's the people who will lead you to that photograph and you need to know where it's going on and then you have to get access. So I called the, uh, it was actually like the treasurer of the town ended up being the person who controlled the space and these access. And so I talked to her and she said, I, it's okay, just don't put the name because a lot of American citizens don't um, want to pay for undocumented people to be buried. And again, the, the military buildup on the border has been very interesting. This was one of the first official, the special response team. There are a variety of kind of SWAT style teams that have been part of the uh, border patrol over t time. And this was one of the first official kind of training program that was broken out. So they finally uh, officially announced this at this when I was photographing these guys. So now there are official SRT teams throughout the border um, border patrol region. And so it's also kind of a photograph to try to give you an idea of the vastness that, of the border area. You know, how do we patrol this? How do you possibly, with a gun, stop people from coming over? And I think that's kind of the the crux of the issue. How do we manage it? Do we include people or do we exclude people? So I've been thinking a lot about that as, I, um, as I've been doing this project and as I've seen people who are really trying to figure out a way to be a part of the society and then end up uh, being excluded systematically. This is the, the, this is the fence in Tijuana um, and uh, there's, a, there's a border fence right at the border of Tijuana and uh, like near San Diego, it's, it's further south. It's right on the border, there's like a fence, and then people used to be able to go up to this fence and, see, and talk to family and like touch and kiss each other through the fence. But now they put up like more fences so that people can't actually touch each other. So that was a, like two years ago. I went back last year and they put these other fences in the space. And deportation, there's 48 flights. I'll show you guys a... Um, a, a uh, video uh, film that I did for MSNBC, but these uh, are deportation flights. There's 48 flights and over 400,000 people deport each year to most of them to Mexico and Central America. This is in Guatemala City, people coming back off the deportation flights. And it really is a pretty disheartening moment for most people. It's kind of, they feel pretty ashamed. And they're photographed for the daily newspaper in Guatemala City. So people are kind of feel, a lot of people, you know, kind of feel ashamed because it's kind of means you didn't, you had all these dreams and this is the moment when you're being re-entering and you may not have any family left, you may not have any options, your, month, your house may up in the, be in the U.S., your family may be in the U.S. And so it's really this, this is where the kind of people are separated and that's what, that's what they have left. A lot of people, just a paper bag or they have more, you know. Depends on their lives. I think visually I try to keep it, uh, try to make it somewhat complex and make layered images that help people understand what's going on. This is a border patrol training and they're just going on this we went on this long hike and this was the day after and everybody's just, they've been training for weeks. And so these are actually the Border Patrol guys and I think much the same, like they're basically just regular guys just like the people coming to the U.S. trying to find a better life. And it's, um, I, I don't really think the narrative is totally accurate on either the left or the right. I think the reality is it's a very complex issue that needs to be depicted in that way. Um, I think we need to show the that there's good and bad, you know, 
and that there's everything in between. And I try to get into that through the pictures, kind of the political aspect on both the left and the right. And so the reality lies really in somewhere in between. But there's a lot of like this very vitriolic kind of visceral hate. And, you know, my father came from Germany at a time when he needed to, and his family and our family need to get out. And it just really makes me kind of, it's just painful. Because to see today all this kind of hate and instead of finding ways to make people really include people and, and uh, in a more effective way, we spend millions and billions of dollars on not including them. <laughs> I just don't think it's the most effective way to deal with uh, border pol you know, immigration policy. And so this was in Den Illinois, uh, in Dennis Hastert's hometown. Uh, the immigration marches. I'm going to kind of immigrant, a uh, Guatemalan guy give me the finger when he got back. You know, the, there's a, there is a lot of anger too. You get, feel like you've been working hard trying to do something better and then you get thrown back. And so this is like photographs of the family I had worked with from about 2000 through 2005 and now I'm returning to the family and I'm going to do a movie about their about their lives. And they, Remedios is in the background. That's Anselmo and Damian. Damian just had his kid. Anselmo and Damian, he, that's uh, his son. And they just went back to Mexico. And so um, they had a house that was bought on a subprime mortgage. And uh, Anselmo lost his job, went back to Mexico with his son. His oldest son left Remedios here. And so Remedios sells elotes on the street to survive and is trying to desperately to keep her house in this prospect. So there's all these like complex things of like, how do people stay together? How do they, what choice do they make? She could leave, but she doesn't want to, you know? She wants to find a way to stay here. And she's been arrested uh, several times for selling corn on the street. She's a grandmother. So these are photographs of the family and all these people are just doing different things. Some are Growing up, that kid's eight now. She do, you know, draws, amazing artist. That's Chela. She has two kids. That was her wedding in Mexico. And then people being, going back in deportations. All right, so I'm going to show you guys the, uh, a video I did. And this is uh, something I think for journalism people and students, it's uh, important to learn how to take your ideas and get them into a mass market. And um, this is a good way. I had spent two years trying to get access to these deportation flights to show what was going on and actually get on them and photograph them. And they kept on saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had, it's hard as a freelancer if you don't have backing. So I used, a, I had another agency that would give me a grant. So I was able to use their name and they wrote me letters. And after two years of writing letters and calling and bugging the people, and they finally called me up and said, John. And I hadn't heard from them for months. And they were like, John, you know, uh, we have a flight for you. Um, do you want to do it? You know, this, this team of journalists had to go to the World Series. And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this, is the, this is the film. And it's just the first, really, I, I think video is an amazing, amazing. The, the new cameras give you this option. The old cameras, you just couldn't make them look like films. It was real hard unless you had like a $100,000 camera to make a movie that looked like film and you couldn't really mimic the photograph. But now with the new DSLR cameras and these full chip cameras, or not even full chip, but the good cameras, you can make these new, uh, it can just totally change the way uh, we see and tell these stories and the way I actually kind of see the world. And so uh, it's been kind of exciting. So I'm gonna show this to y'all. If you come into the U.S. illegally and get caught, this is how you might leave. On a deportation flight operated by the U.S. Customs and Immigration Enforcement, or ICE. The agency is part of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. 
We have about 48 flights a week from various parts of the United States. They are not U.S. citizens. They never came through a port of entry and checked in with us. Or they were on a visa and that visa expired and they didn't leave. These flights are part of a flow of nearly 400,000 people who are sent back to their home countries each year. It's estimated that over 10 million people are in the U.S. illegally, a number that has dropped in recent years. The reasons for immigrating vary. The vast majority leave their homes in search of better economic opportunity. Yet sometimes it's about relationship problems or trouble with the law, or a combination of reasons, like for this passenger, Daniel, who had a job in Mexico. Yo trabajaba en una fábrica y no no me pagaban muy bien. Entonces un amigo me comentó que aquí en Estados Unidos estaban pagando mucho mejor. Y yo tengo un hijo que está enfermo de autismo. Entonces son muchos gastos que yo hacía y no me alcanzaba mi sueldo. Estranged from his wife, Daniel spent the past few years in the U.S., where he started a new family. Now Mexico doesn't feel like home. No sé dónde voy a dormir, si voy a dormir en un puente o voy a dormir en la terminal de autobuses. For Mexicans like Daniel, the flight to Texas is followed by a bus ride to a border crossing. Y me siento mal. Me siento mal, tengo ganas de llorar porque extraño a mi hija. No sé qué hacer. Their journey ends with a walk across the Rio Grande and into Mexico. For many of them, it's a disappointment. Their dream of America has just uh, ended for them. Deportation flights also travel to other countries in Latin America. This flight is carrying Guatemalans back to their country. Two years ago, this kind of flight carried Miguel home. His family crossed into the U.S. illegally when he was small, just four years old. Nobody asked me when I was small, you want to go to the United States? You know, I was right over here. My mom did what she had to do. You know, We just wanted to have a better life. That's the only thing we wanted to do. After 15 years growing up in America, Miguel was stopped on a routine traffic stop. He sped away and tried to evade the police, but was caught. They discovered his illegal status. It was too hard with what they did, you know, separating me from my family. I would have wanted to be, if it was possible, in jail and still be able to see my family. Because money, I could make it anywhere else. I know I could have a good life anywhere else, but I can't have my family right now. For Miguel, Guatemala is now the foreign country. But when we're getting down on Guatemala and really close up, I could see the cars and, and the buses and everything different. And I, and I knew that I was coming to a man, a worse place than where I was. Deportation can have a silver lining, reunions with family not seen for years. For others, deportation means not only losing their livelihood, but losing touch with families started in their new home. Julio recalls his deportation flight four years ago, after living nearly two decades in the United States. He left behind a wife and son. I don't know about them anything. You know. 
I don't know how, how they do it, I don't know if they're eating or... She's mom, she doesn't really speak English, you know, so I had to take him to the school, to the dentist, the doctors, and all the appointments he got. It's sad, I feel sad. Longing for his family, fearing the violence in Guatemala, and having no luck finding a job, Julio tried to return to the U.S. I tried, but I just got to up there to the Mexican border and came back here to Guatemala. Because I was scared, you know, I got caught again. Well, I just wish it were possible for these folks to have a good quality of life at home. You know, and, that, and I think we're all working for that in the world to end the disparity so that people would not have to travel such a long way and live this kind of half-life. The hazards of returning to America and potentially getting caught are a risk some deportees are still willing to take. So the cycle begins again. One of the men I interviewed for this story has already crossed back into the U.S. just three months after his deportation. In Guatemala, I'm John Lowenstein reporting for MSNBC.com. <clears throat> So that was uh, that was the uh, first uh, story and uh, that I did with uh, film with video and it was a challenge uh, on the editing side. I think they did uh, MSNBC Meredith Burke. It really did most of it, did the editing and uh, the story was really they kind of contained it to the deportation flights and a few of the people. Uh, so I think there's a, a million more things you can do. You know I can do about the issue. But uh, I, I was pretty happy with it. So at least we got the story out and showed it, you know, a lot of people could see it. So, uh, but I think that's, I'm ready to do the next phase. <laughs> what should we sit here? Maybe if Larry. Oh, no, you can sit here. You sit there. Come, Larry. Have a seat. You know where you're supposed to sit. Okay, I'll be here just a Okay, should we cut the lights a little bit down so, so we can see people in the audience? I guess not. <laughs> I need to videotape. <laughs> uh, so, questions, comments? Yes, right here. Um, could you guys talk about your experience in trying to get your picture published in like mainstreams? I know you talked about how magazines publish different stories and you publish um, well, we, um, John and I are both um, are owners of an agency. There are 10, 10 photographers in this agency. Um, we're all from around the world. And so we, we um, seek out markets in several different countries. Um, we are less excited about the American market these days. Um, <laughs> as becomes more and more dominated by fewer and fewer corporations with seemingly um, less interest in any kind of investigative work. And so um, we, um, I would say, a good portion of our living is made selling in the European market to um, mainly magazines and also doing exhibitions. And um, other than that, it's just making connections with photo editors Sometimes I'm teaming up with writers, pitching stories jointly, um, and trying to figure out what their interests might be and how we can sort of inspire them to think a bit broader or a little more creatively. Um, I think that most editors want to hear ideas, and then it's whether they have the power to commission them or at least look at the work. Yeah, I think the, uh, the difficulty right now is that there's few, the budgets are fewer and smaller, and the interest. I think the interest is there among the populace. I mean, people want to learn about this stuff. But I think there's been a, a phenomenon in the U.S. I don't in U.S. journalism, I don't, and I don't quite understand it. But it seems like it's just the support for in-depth investigative journalism has been uh, really slashed. Um, so we just have to find a lot of new ways. One of the ways we did that was by teaming up with you know together and finding ways to maximize our strengths as a group. And so I think that's an important, uh, and I see that happening with other photographers. I also think education possibilities and exhibitions, we have to think of a lot of different outlets <clears throat> and not just rely on uh, traditional outlets.
because um, you know you, you don't always get to tell the story the way you see it. You know, like what Nina was saying about the way her story, the photographs they presented. So with the new me with new media, I think there's a lot of possibilities. Like the tools that are at our that are in our hands right now are probably the most powerful tools to tell stories ever in the history of humankind besides just storytelling. Um, and you can reach a lot of people. The trick is how do you fund that because it takes a lot of time and dedication and energy to get out there and really be able to spend the time. And as you still have to be able to you know, eat as a working professional. So I think getting the work out is there's a lot of possibilities, but being able to fund the work, that's a different story. In the back? Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan over the years uh, of the magazines that we had in America for many years, Life and Look, which of course now basically are non-existent, having been witness to the television and, and what happened there. Is Europe a little bit more, um, uh, do they have a vibrant picture magazine still as we used to have uh, in this country? Yeah, they, st they also believe that, that the photographer and the writer are two distinct voices. So um, you can do a, a story that's, you know, maybe you get five or six double spread pages as photographs that may or may not mirror the writing. So they see the photographer as unique voice. That's something that I don't know if we ever achieved in the United States, even in Look in Life. Um, even today, when we pitch stories, it's ultimately the text side, the, the word side, that has to sign off. Right? They're, the, they're the, the highest boss. Whereas in Europe, that's not necessarily true. But they still have a vibrant uh, magazine culture, and the magazines are bigger, and you can have just pictures. It's it's changing a bit, but definitely still uh, much more vibrant here. Yeah, it's just definitely more vi vibrant and viable still there. It's uh, definitely. I really appreciate this two photograph for showing these pictures. There's a, one Chinese word. Uh, Word thousand words, you know, like an uh, article, newspaper, whatever, they wrote it, but they, we have uh, nothing to do with it. But picture, when we look at it, we can write our own story. We can write our own article, our novel. So it was really well done and done. Actually, I cried watching this because I'm a, a so-called uh, legal immigrant, you know, so I know how they feel. And I went through the Korean War, I know how the it, people suffer. So, uh, Korean War, Vietnamese War, when they came back, they didn't welcomed by the people. Like a uh, Second World War, a victory parade and balloons and whatever, whatever. But Korean War, Vietnam War, they were kind of uh, uh, side to side. And especially now, Iraqi War veterans, people in the United States, they don't appreciate them. You know, so that's uh, something we should do about it. We should uh, appreciate them and then do everything we can uh, for them to get help, you know. U.S. government, somehow I feel they kind of set aside the, the, the soldiers, really. Uh, so they're really suffering, so we should really appreciate them. And I saw the uh, five-year-old boy came to the United States, he lived there 14 years. He's American in heart, and then he's a contributing member of the family. But deport him, it might be legal, but it's immoral. It's inhuman. And uh, we, uh, American people should fear something. There should be some way to correct these uh, immoral things. Uh, so I really appreciate those. Uh, uh, one last thing I could say is uh, LA Times carried a cartoon. I was very impressed. It's still on my mind. It's uh, the Native Americans at the Bo Sea. So the thousands of uh, pilgrims coming ship after ship coming to boat United States, and they told each other, you know what, we should limit those immigrants. 
<laughs> but uh, now we are here, we say, no, no, we have to limit them. But uh, when the American Indians, they are right. <laughs> they should have, you know. But anyway, thank you very much. Let's give them a big applause. All right, thank you. <laughs> you know, can I say one thing about the, um, the young guy who was, he's referring to in the, in the movie? You know, the process of being deported for him was really a moment when he had to kind of grow up and decide what he wanted to, to be. And, and he really became, I think, a man at that point. And it was, it's really unfortunate because he talked about, and this is the hard part, I think, with, with any film, any documentary, it's hard to show everything that you, you learn about somebody. And he talked a lot about the sacrifices his mother made and then how he and his sister, when they became adolescents, um, really didn't appreciate these sacrifices. She worked two jobs. And then they were out partying. You know, her, his sister got into gangs, and he got into these, like, you know, kick cars, real fast cars. And he was kind of like, but he wasn't like, felt like an American teenager. And he, in all, for all intents and purposes, he wasn't an American t teenager. He just doesn't have the legal papers. So for him, he paid this kind of ultimate price of being sent away from his family. He went home and then had to really at that moment decide who he was as he re-entered this world that he, where he really was from. And so it's a, um, I wish you could put all that into the movie, but it's just like, you know, you ha I'd have to do a longer movie. And that's why I'm doing a longer movie to get into more of these issues. Oh. I have a question. Um, when, you, when you go into an environment and you try to photograph the subject, I can tell that there's a, there's a passionate relationship with the subject. But how do you develop that you know, when it becomes a tough situation in life, or they're at the fence and they're bringing the family members? How do you not intrude, but how do you put a part of the environment and photograph that? Um, in terms of fence, you know, they were really nice, that family. There was like 20 people and they were all eating ice cream. And, you know, you're, you're watching and watching and just talking to them a little bit. Of getting information, talking to them. In that situation, I really didn't de develop a really long relationship. I just am developing this kind of quick relationship where I just kind of try to get into the situation and understand a little bit of what's going on in that moment. And then you're photographing and photographing and photographing, and then you see this really kind of tender moment, you know. So I have other pictures that are, but it, it, to me, the separation was really, you know, I'd seen pictures there, but. That just trying to show what that separation of not being able to go. And the family is from Tijuana. So really, it's like San Diego and Tijuana. So they're like, I mean, it's not San Diego, but it's the border town and then Tijuana. So it's like families separated by this border policy. So I just try to, but there's many relationships that are different where you, over years, spent time with people and they become friends. You become part of their family. and all that. So there's depends on the situation, I think, too. I think um, that. The people have to feel like they trust you and also that you're there to really learn. And that um, I think everything about you, your body language, the questions you ask, the way you listen, um, telegraphs that. And if people feel as though that you're there as a taker, right, only, then they'll probably react in that way. And so I think that. Um, for journalists, for those working under deadlines, like daily deadlines, it becomes very difficult because they feel the pressure of having to get something when their boss says they must have it, right? And so this um, often leads to more surface kind of reporting. But if you choose the way me and John chose, which is, you know, we're really our own bosses most of the time. and um, and we can relax a bit more and watch, right? And not be so aggressive. So I feel like I'm a pretty good listener and that helps me be a, a good observer. And I also think mm -hmm. in terms of being independent and knowing why you're there, that's really key. Like I knew why I was in this situation right. photographing and I care about it, but I also knew kind of what that, a little bit about the separation. That was something I'm interested in. And I care about it, and I've seen it. So I think translating that to people, it becomes more genuine. Whereas sometimes, if you're sent on an assignment, and you don't know anything about it, and you don't really have any personal connection to it, it's harder to translate that 
and people kind of can see through that sometimes. So, yeah. Um, kind of on the other side of that question, how is it being an observer and not kind of being sure you were getting involved? Because I know, I think on John's website, it said something how like when you were uh, filming or photographing like the illegal crossing, they asked like, you know, if someone drowns, are you gonna like jump in and save them or are you right. So how do you like both deal with that line observing and not? I think that line moves every time at every story, that it's not a, I mean, for me that line has moved like this way to, where like subject becomes like a family member, right? And then other times I know like, where I realize I want to keep a boundary for maybe lots of different reasons. Maybe what's going on in my life right now, maybe how much I feel like I want to invest in the subject, maybe how, um, together or not together the subject is, right? Like, I don't want to be a social worker, even though lots of times the role of a journalist and a photographer, because you are there with them, can often feel like that. Um, you know, and, and so I don't, I know with the Purple Hearts, people I knew, like, they didn't need me as their mother, right? I'm not their mother, I'm not their sister but I was definitely a sympathetic year. And so, um, but I'm, you know, and I did some things, right, to help with certain situations, but I'm not gonna become their advocate for in the VA, like on some sort of full-time basis. Let me ask mm. you, all of the pictures we saw from, from both of you are really people you care about and people you admire, or people you wanna help. Have you ever had experience, because I certainly can see how this would happen, as a photographer, photographing people whom you actually don't like or, oh, yeah. or don't admire, and how does you know how does that kind of issue come up when you're photographing people who you, know, you, you feel very differently about, but you're still there as a as a photographer? I don't I don't think you always like everybody you photograph. Like I mean, there you have a feeling of affinity sometimes, but well, but I mean a little know, stronger than that. I mean, yeah. the people where you're trying to document something <laughs> you dislike them. Trying well, to document something yeah, to, in effect, know, expose it rather than... Be <laughs> I've had kind of like half my career has been that in <laughs> many ways, and it's like actually was a way that I was motivated. You know, I really like despised them. I like despised what they stood for. I, I wanted to kind of understand where it came from. You know, I was kind of sickened at the power of it. and. You know, one of the first politicians I ever photographed was an ex-Klansman. And when he went to shake my hand, I was, you know, like, disgusted. And then and I shook his hand, and then I, you know, spent the next day berating myself for doing that, <laughs> right? And so, you know, but, like, my whole thing was pierce through that, like, pretty armor that he created, right? And so, like, how can I do that? And so I think it, it can be a really good so is there an ethical issue there? Do you feel an obligation to be nice? Well, or, or no, like or to be fair, to be honest, honest about what it is that you're. You know, it's like I'm. You know, by the way, I I'm not going to be. But you know, like sympathetic to you. It's um. <coughs> there's another member of our group um, named Stanley Green, a really fine photographer, and he was talking recently, and he had this great quote, and he goes, "It's a journalist's job to upset you in the morning." And I also often feel that, especially covering people running for political office, that you are there to investigate, to peel back the layers they've mm -hmm. worked so hard to construct. And you're there to sort of zero in on what you think is some truth. Um, you know, I've, I haven't taken some pictures because they seem to me like gotcha pictures that are just kind of like, you know, it's like, I once saw Bush drinking a beer, okay, George W., years ago. Well, he claims that he's sober and dry. And I thought, hmm, you know, do I want to be known for the photographer that shot Bush drinking a beer, right? And so, and it wasn't like even a good image. It was just like, oh, there he is. That wasn't such an important picture to me, but like showing something else where you could sort of get at like who he was more, that's more important. Would you distinguish in that context between public figures and 
what you might call private citizens, people who aren't, I think of Bush, the other politicians, those are all people who are sort of by definition, including by legal definition, uh, entitled to less privacy as people who have chosen to be public figures to run for office mm. uh, and so forth. You know, you know, is, it a little, is it different when you're dealing with people who are private citizens but who may be engaged in you know, problematic behavior? Or, have you ever photographed anyone that, like a private citizen that you kind of oh. were interested in uncovering? <laughs> I haven't really, uh, I'm trying to think who I've really disliked or I've photographed. I haven't, I haven't done as much political photography, I think, as Nina. Well, I, I spent a lot of time photographing yeah. fundamentalists that um, yeah. I think uh, my, I, I wanted to show <clears throat> the intensity of their ideology. and. You know, it, what's interesting is that a lot of times pictures that maybe some people think are taking a jab at someone, the subject of the picture may think are absolutely honest mm -hmm. and laudatory pictures. Yeah, no, that does happen. Yeah, If, if you know often. the blood in the face, you know, James Ledbetter, there was a documentary about the Aryan nation yeah. People out in, I think, Idaho or something. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene, probably. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, most audiences see it as an incredible expose, and they just loved it. They loved it, right. You know, exactly. A, a chance to tell their story. Mm -hmm. They had no, uh, no ambivalence. So I think that does often, often happen. Mm -hmm. Although one of the other experiences mm -hmm. that documentary makers often have, Fred Weissman and my others, is, mm -hmm. that, is that the subjects really like the, uh, what they see until they watch it with an audience. Really? And then when they, hear, when they hear the audience reaction, they're not so sure anymore because they realize that the audience is not seeing it the way they uh, see it. Mm -hmm. Dan? When you get sent on an assignment, if you're a, you have a, you have a agency, this loose agency, I guess, and someone assigns you something, and you come back with 500 images, and do you edit them? Do you, if they say, give me 100, 100 pictures, or they say, I want to see them all? And when they choose them and, and send them out to whoever who's ever asking for them, and you see pictures and you go, that wasn't what I intended. I mean, does that happen, or how do you how do you are you involved in the editing process at all? Yeah. I mean, on the assignments, I mean, the, the thing you did in Mexico, I understand the, the deportation that was more your own self assignments, but you mentioned you, you've been on assignments. So. Yes, we both did assignments. <clears throat> I mean, nowadays, uh, you don't send all the raw film anymore because there's no film. Well, some well, yeah. once in a while, you shoot yeah. film for an assignment. I shoot film, but usually it's not an assignment. But for digital, yeah, you go through and check the pictures. I basically edit a first take and knock it pretty. Because generally, I've learned the best thing is not to give a picture if you don't like it. <laughs> don't show it to the editor. That's kind of a pretty early yeah. lesson you learn. And, Newspaper journalism. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah, definitely edit it down and then caption it and then send it. And then sometimes they come back once in a while and say, "Hey, we'd like to see more," because I sometimes show really tight edits and they go, "Well, what else do you have?" But usually they just. You can you know, also, with some publications, ask for layout beforehand, right. and then discuss with them that layout. Oh. And I mean, that used to be the way life worked in the old days, you'd sit with the editor and look at the layout together and then make changes together. But, um, but with yeah, photo, I... With the photo editor. With the photo editor. The um, I mean, I had a situation just last week where I, um, uh, Magazine Italy wanted to run some pictures and I wanted to look at the text and their layout first and then I looked at it and then I told them they couldn't run anything. Ooh. Why? Okay. Because it was garbage, what they wanted to do. and. Wanted. What, what they wanted to do and, and you know and, and one thing that like for me the most important thing as I become more experienced in my career and get older is I want more control not less control and so I fight very hard to keep control because you can see how when you lose that control things that you worked really really hard to express can be flipped upside down and I mean, I saw, we saw this recently in a case of a Time Magazine cover. I don't know if people have discussed this picture of this young woman um, brutalized in Afghanistan. And the, uh, the cover line was, 
what will happen if we leave or something like this. And it was, you know, um, of course, the irony is that it happened while we were there. Mm -hmm. But then it, you know, came out the same week of like WikiLeaks, the whole like Afghanistan. So, so I felt, I know that the photographer, I didn't talk to her, but I felt like, man, what if that was me? I feel devastated that my picture being used for such clear propaganda purposes. So, but going back to your People mm. magazine, People magazine hired you to do the Marine wedding. Yeah. I mean, and you, you, I assume you edited the photo, but you said you put the one where she's standing there with the backdrop. I mean, she doesn't look happy. I mean, that's the one that you, you mentioned. I mean, she's standing there, he, and she doesn't look happy at all. And that's, I mean, I've seen your, I mean, you, you were here before, and I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were talking about So I knew yeah. that they'd broken up after three yeah. months. You know, you said that was what you saw. You saw the, you're the social worker. You see what's going on. That's that was my impression clearly of, of the dynamic of that relationship. But then, right. you know, as I say, another photographer may have shot it completely different. Or, not, or left it out. Or left it out. Or never se never seen it. Didn't see a lot of day. They they oh. showed the, the happy images because they they go, well, it's a wedding. It's happy. They have sweethearts. Because, Love conquers all. Because the. And, and then I'll, I'll leave it to another question, but the, I think that the central problem of American journalism and the central problem of tabloid journalism is that they've written the story before anything's been reported or shot, <laughs> right. okay? And so, like, when I rejected this story in the Italian magazine, they never talked to anybody. They just, like, wrote some... It's like, where is this coming from? Oh, wow. right. Wasn't it Hearst who said, you give us the pictures, we'll give you the war? Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, so that's, that's an old one, yes. Um, you both said that these were projects. So how are you able to financially support doing the journalism that you love while also financially supporting yourself at the same time? Well, I can speak for myself with uh, this project. I've supported it through, like it started out, I was uh, basically a staff member of this project. Started the project, pitched it myself, started then, then I applied for different grants. Uh, and I've gotten different grants across the years and sold stories and some of it's come out of my own pocket too. So it's kind of like a whole variety of ways to support it. And you know, for a number of years I worked for another group, a uh, foundation, which basically gave me enough money to work uh, on, the, on the other project I was working on, the Shadow Lives, while I was doing other work. So a variety of ways, yeah. But it's a challenge, it's constantly a challenge. It's become more difficult too. Mm -hmm. Because we're not really able to sell the stories as easily in the U.S. And uh, it's just more and more competitive. And I think there's, for some reason, like, not as much, well, obviously the economy is hurting. But there's also been, I, you just see less and less kind of support for uh, investigative journalism. So. Do you think you're impacted also by the explosion of what in, in some contexts is called user-generated content? You know? The, the, you know, the people formerly known as the audience produ producing <laughs> their own content the and putting it up on the web. And, uh, I don't think that we've been impacted yet on that. Um, I don't know if you've had situations. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, there's the whole Flickr issue. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that maybe that's done is like, more generally depress the value, the monetary value of pictures, so that you used to be able to sell an image for X amount of money. Now that's like X amount of money. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, you know, the so that's part of what I meant, yeah. that the supply of pictures. I think, yeah, digital photography definitely. I mean, in my mind, digital photography has changed everything. Changed the whole uh, reality for professionals uh, working. In, in good and bad ways, and it's also opened up a whole way that people all over the world can tell their own stories, and people mm -hmm. learn from each other. I mean, the way we learned like 15 years ago or 12 years ago was basically uh, through a magazine, a book, or if you got lucky enough to go like a photo exhibit, and that was where the you know most readily available means to understand photography and learn. Now I could go on, and I have gone on when we're looking for new members see 200 photographers all over the world in, in a course of a day or two mm -hmm. and look at their websites. And they're looking at our work. So you see people in other countries all over the world. I, you know, we go and do workshops and you see people and like, yeah, they're looking at our work and we're looking at their work. And it's, 
uh, pretty amazing. So I think it's a like in a lot of ways it's good. I think it's hard for you know first world journalists, some in some ways because it's become more difficult uh, to fund your work in some ways. But I think in, in terms of overall the changes are great. I think it's good that there's more media out there and more opportunity to tell stories all over the world. One last question, somebody. All right. The picture you shot uh, when you showed the video, of the, the, the look, it looked like you shot it in film. Mm, no. Did, oh, yeah. did you shoot in film? Okay. Mm -hmm. With all the, all the soldiers that were injured. Because you, your Marine pictures are obvious, but they're digital. That's okay. Unless you shot Hector or something. But the Marine wedding seemed like it was uh, digital. Yeah, that was all digital. But the first ones were all um, uh, Fuji transparency. Oh, film. Uh, yeah, there were 150 um, ASA shot uh, two and a quarter. Okay. Oh, two and a quarter. Yeah. So that's wow. Okay. Last question, ma'am. Um, what have you expressed the frustration um, about the um, um, decreased interest in in depth investigative uh, journalism because of media concentration in the U.S. Um, and some of you turn to other markets, but do you see the U.S. any you know major changes in the future in the U.S. market, or you know are you comfortable with it, or do you want to like reverse that trend? <laughs> Did you everybody hear the question? The, the the questioner was noting that there'd been a sort of people had, had talked about the concentration of media in, in the U.S. and the reduction of support for investigative journalism. And she was asking whether they think that will change and whether it's a good thing. I don't think anyone thinks it's a good thing. You know, but what might change, and I think if I could add part of it, yeah, that, is that one of the things that's happened in one of the places where investigative journalism is kind of starting to bubble up again is in what is often referred to as the blogosphere. Mm -hmm. So that the Huffington Post, for example, is opening or beginning uh, to support or to, um, to uh, find money from various sources to support investigative journalism and others as well. Uh, there are kind of coalitions of websites that are trying to support investigative journalism. But one question that would be interesting is whether that has spilled over into uh, photojournalism uh, or photojournalistic investigative reporting because most of what I've seen uh, coming from these new sources is all text. All text. And the web, I mean, as, as John said, it's, it's an incredible uh, medium for mm. visual reporting. I mean, it's, it's terrific. You know, the iPad yeah. probably more than anything. I think, um, like I had, I went to an organization uh, a few months ago, and I think that they start out often with uh, writers, you know, and invest, investigative writing journalists who often are, you know, in a lot of ways, do the invest the hard core crunching of numbers and mm -hmm. which is you know a lot of what investigative journalists crunching numbers and looking into papers and all the stuff that we do do research but then now they're starting to see wow we we need some visual we need the yeah. the photographers and the documentarians right. too yeah. so I, I think it, it's it's changing it, but it I think it's likely will happen I mean it's the they're starting the, to see in, it in the last you know five or six years maybe more than that. There's really been an, uh, a growth in documentaries. Yeah, yeah. Film and a lot of the yeah. investigative uh, right. reports that we see now are in the form of, of video or film documentary. Bob right. Greenwald's work, Alex Gibney, mm -hmm. others. I mean, they're coming out now. Yeah. And in part, it, the combination of DVD and, 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 the, and the internet has given them distribution opportunities yeah. they didn't have. I mean, movie theaters rarely want to just, movie distributors rarely want to carry uh, documentaries, even the Al Gore one that you know did so well in, in some ways wasn't widely shown theatrically. But they can be distributed through DVD and, and online or Netflix and so forth. And that can extend. I mean, there, there's no reason why not, and therefore it's very likely that, 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 uh, that photojournalism will begin to be able to take advantage of those, of those opportunities. But what people are doing, and I think to different, de differing degrees of success, is that um, nonprofits are becoming um, media creators. Yep. So ACLU is doing their own media. Uh, Dr. Zod Borders is doing its own media. And, um, and so 
depending upon the, the freedom of the photographers to you know, work on these stories and see them as stories or see them as promotional pieces, right? Um, I think that you can sometimes find really good um, examples of this work and then sometimes it's just clearly okay, it's just like a public service announcement for the nonprofit. But um, they're sometimes paying more money and getting more time like Doctors Without Borders or Human Rights yeah. Watch would give yep. two, three weeks sometimes for an assignment, maybe pay you half of what in a magazine used to, but they realize, okay, you wanna look at people who are having serious human rights issues and violations, you need two, three weeks to try and find the people, you know, photograph them in a way that maintains their safety, right? And so. They seem to understand better what's required to do work than magazines today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and ProPublica also has started to work with photographers specifically, so that you know, uh, for longer term assignments. And, and, that, and they started out almost exclusively as I think writing, and then have also collaborated with newspapers, New York Times, and other newspapers, and now independent freelance. Photographers. So, right. The interesting thing, thing is, if you do say uh, a project for Doctors Without Borders, um, you can sell it to a European magazine. If you do a project funded by Doctors Without Borders, you can't sell it to an American magazine because they'll say you're doing advocacy work and not journalism. <laughs> right. So that's actually a really serious problem it because is, yeah. what you're being paid by Doctors Without Borders is no way going to support yourself. So you have to resell the piece. But if you can't sell it to the American market because of this idea of objectivity, right, um, then you're kind of like limited yeah. completely. And we've, we've had, had some of our members issue, yeah. had that happen, come up, not just once. Yeah, so and then had stories killed. Killed uh, when like they discovered that, oh, you know, they actually were paid $200. Right. <laughs> doctors without to borders. Do so they must now be like a mouthpiece for that group right, or something. Right. Uh, I have a question. How many of you are uh, USC students? Good. Well, uh, you may be interested, given the topic tonight, that in the School of Communication next semester, we offer a course that we've that's been taught before. Jim Hubbard, who is another activist photographer, uh, has teaches a course here in the spring called Visual Communication and Social Change. And you might want to check out the class because it's very much in the spirit of what we've been uh, seeing and talking about tonight. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, um, thank and thank you. our speakers. Thank you so much. And I think there's more reception upstairs and a book signing opportunity. Yeah, their books are courtesy of USC. So if you're interested in any of this, there are some up there. Go get them. Yeah. <laughs>